classics. Catalyst. Instinctively. Thank you. Thank you. This is this Immerse, is the, podcast the podcast in book. In book. We are delighted, we are delighted to, have to have you join us. Immerse is, Immerse is produced by Charlie by Morrow, Morrow, Sean McCann, Sean McCann and Bart Plantenga for Morrow Sound, Vermont, Vermont and Helsinki, and, Helsinki, and, recital, and recital Edition, edition Los, Angeles. Los, Angeles. Los Angeles. Immerse. 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 head of education in Colorado, in Denver, at the Gates Planetarium. And he's an astrophysicist and a dome animator. But he, he wrote this article called Immersive Media Before the Computer. And it's re- really beautiful. He inspired me to go forward and try to uh, interview and talk to people about what they are doing in immersive media. And then I, I asked two questions. What, it, you know, what are you doing and, and, and what is it and what interests you in it? And the other is just what in your past inspired you to work in sound and leads up to this. Is that, is that all, all in respect to, in regards to immersive sound? Well, immersive immersive media in general, because some of my clients are, are museum designers and they're architects. One of them is a philosopher. He's an inventor of virtual reality. Um, another's a, a psychologist who studied reactions to music. So I suppose it, it's mostly sound. It's really about sound, yes. I have to have to say that. Sound in relationship to the world. Anyway to experiment. Okay, well, um, let, me, let me go backwards, I would say. Let me, let me just start off with when I started you know, getting into, I wouldn't say immersive sound, but the first experience I had, which really blew me away, was the um, first time working in Dolby SR, um, in the movie domain, the film domain. You know? um, I think I started in 1994 mixing movies. And uh, we started mixing in Dolby SR, which, as you know, basically a four-channel, a two-channel decoded signal. Um, and uh, that was the first experience where I realized that you can space sound. You can space sound. You can put it in sort of a direction. You can have it move around in a very limited way. And it's Dolby SR because the back channel, the Atmo channel, was really only used for music and, and atmos and no effect. If that is anything which, which don't really interest you, which is not part of um, the topic, let me know. I should just ramble on. No,
uh, what it is that's that's excited you, what you enjoyed working with, what uh, spoke to you, and well, the, the first thing, which if I go even further back, when I was a professional musician, I a lot of times I went to the movies, and that that really blew me away with, with the, the sound in the movie theater. And I said, um, if there's any chance, I'd like to have a second profession, being a sound engineer, but not sound engineer in the music studio, then in post production studio. In those days, I didn't even know what the post-production house was. So I sort of had a chance in 1991 um, with Coton Studios Day. Because I broke my hand, I couldn't play for years, so I, I thought I might as well do an internship in a studio. And I got the chance at Coton Studios here in Hamburg, and that's, that's where I started, doing sound, basically. And after a while, you know, I played music and I did sound. I had to decide, should I do music in the future only, or sound, and I opted for the sound. I got, I got stuck in the sound business, which was good. Um, and after Dolby um, SR, we started you know, doing a 5.1, Dolby Digital, then Enhanced Dolby Digital. Sorry, it got more sophisticated in play. It was but pretty much, it was all Dolby um, because they had, um, they were so big in the market. Of course, you also had SDDS and DTS, but those are also channel-based, you know, 5.1, 7.1 formats. Also, we did some THX formats, um, custom formats, which were linked to specific venues. And, you know, I did a lot of those, a lot in the movie business, but it took a while until something new happened. And um, that was when I was asked to do a recording for, I wouldn't say an image film, it was a presentation for EOSONO. We were recording together with my friend Volker Zeigermann, who is a sound engineer and on location sound engineer. He has a lot more experience than I have, so I took him with me. And they were sort of building up their Unisono um, presentation lab in Berlin. It was a hundred, I think it still is, I don't, I don't know, I haven't really seen it for a while. And Unisono doesn't really exist in that way, which, uh, which it existed in 1990, when was that, 1998 or something like that. It was 180 degrees presentation in studio lab. And what we did is they were shooting a film at the medieval festival in Mindelheim. And they asked us just to bring along whatever we needed to do, just to do sound recording, immersive sound recording. It wasn't called that way. It was at that time, we just called it surround sound. And so we took um, eight chips microphones, um, cardioid chips microphones and put it in the circle and we built sort of a stand. It was, I think, it was about a meter and 20 wide. And then we went along the camera, uh, which worked quite fine because they obviously couldn't do a lot of movements um, that's static images. Because if you stand in front of a 180 um, degree um, screen, which was really high, two, two meter 50, then you can't really cope with um, busy movements. So we recorded that and eventually that um, was released in their presentation room, there was my first experience with real immersive sound, with even sono sound, basically. And then it took quite a while until something new happened, which was that the director of, you know, Thomas Kralpa, Planetarium in Hamburg, he told me that he would like to invest in a new sound system. And he was approached by Rainy Rodriguez, which you know, you know um, who scaled down the Eosono to special sound wave. I mean, you know the story because the Eosono, they even tried, as you probably also know, to um, get involved in the cinema business, which they didn't succeed in because it's just so expensive. And I, to be honest, it also wasn't really, um, as far as the mixing is concerned, we really up to game then that you could really mix it, mix the film with the Eosono. Um, it's fall, you know, the degree isn't really ready yet, and the whole system didn't really work successfully yet at that moment. So Thomas Dropper then bought the Spatial Soundwave, and since I work a lot for them, I bought my own system, and that's how it got more serious. And since ever then, I've been involved. It's a 20% part of my business I'm doing here, it's not all of it, but that's how I got involved, in, in the, especially in the planetarium world, as far as immersive sound is concerned if you can call it that way. I mean, sometimes if you have a really big room and you have 64 speakers, quite hard to really get in, into your head, the sound, if you're sitting, um, if you don't have headphones and anything like that. Um, in a small room, like in the Yosono room in Berlin, that was more immersive than it is in planetarium, I have to say. But still, it's on the run. And so now um, I'm wondering 
what's going to happen next. I haven't really done any small scale, meaning VR sound productions. We did a couple of VR sound stuff, mostly music and um, language based image films, but we really haven't done any large scale VR sound. So I'm not that proficient as far as VR sound is concerned. We tried a few uh, plugins and the Sonics and um, the Sennheiser plugin in MU. Um, we also have more sound. We have the SAD, the uh, special audio designer we work with. So we're still trying to figure out what is the best plugin for us to work with. So let's quick run now. That's a great rundown. I'm wondering, uh, speaking um, to the idea of what's immersive, th there's a, what, when you have a really properly immersive experience, there's sort of a click and then you're in an immersive sound that it, it's different from not being in an immersive sound. And I wonder if you could describe that click. What, what is it when it really works? How would you describe that? Because that would help us people to know what it is and also how to make it happen more reliably. Well, it, it especially happens when, when it um, touches me, I would say, um, emotion. I, I don't mean it in respect of um, love movie or something like that. It's just that, or can I explain that? That's a difficult question you ask me. Well, it's what's so difficult to, about making music, you know? Yeah, you're right. I think making music is a bit, a bit different, I think, because making music is a different talent. You need to really grasp people, to really make them shiver, and to really make them emotionally um, involved. They have to be emotionally involved. And I have sort of have the feeling that the immersive sound a lot of times is, or what I consider to be immersive sound, what I hear, a lot of times are more of a technical aspect rather than um, a... Um, a creative aspect all the times. And I think you also have to distinguish between pure audio or audio linked to, to image, to video. Um, audio linked to video works a lot better in general because you have two, you have two senses you can use. And for the sound also, when you see, I mean, I, you can go to the movies and there's a soundtrack. There are a lot of great soundtracks um, in the movies, a lot of blockbusters, they have ex exceptional sound. I mean, in my experience, it's only 5.1 in Dolby Digital, and also feels, feels immersive, but that's also because you have the image. So if you have no image at all, it's, it's quite hard to have the sense of immersive sound, especially when you use language, that, that's quite difficult, I think. So for the most part, for me, immersive sound works if you take me into the sound, if you have Atmos, music, special design sounds. It's more linked to the concept itself rather than the technical part of the immersive transportation of the sound. I know what you mean, and I'm wondering, then taking that more broadly, do you have recollections of, of experiences with sound in real life when you were a kid or at any point where it took you away? What, what were some of the most important experiences that that, that you had with sound uh, because you know when it really touched you emotionally in, in real life I would say a lot of times there was music and as I said before because being born into a sound environment and having two ears it sort of comes natural that you don't even think about um, immersive sound because it's it's there all the time that what, what makes it so difficult to transport it to a, to a model, to an artificial world and to make it really happen that you believe it's it's immersive sound because you're not linked to that scene at the moment you're sort of taken off the scene and you put into a scene which is not there in the real world and now you have to sound immersive so i think that's very difficult to conceive and um so mostly for the most part for instance i saw Pink Floyd concert and um, in music. I went a lot of times to classical concerts um, in my younger age, and that was in, in the concert hall. I think that's really, you really have a nice natural immersive sound. And um, so I got also interested in recording orchestras, which I really haven't done a lot. And I also couldn't go to the, to uh, Tourmeister um, school in, in that mode because I don't play piano. I would like to do that, but I just simply couldn't do it because. Um, you really have to take care of the little things to have it sound big and uh, immersive, I think. So I think to sum it up, it's more the natural sounds I like rather than the amplified sounds. Like Pink Floyd was amplified, of course, but it was pretty big. Oh, I forgot also to, to, to say that I started going to, to musicals because I, I played a bunch of musicals. So I, I started to also to go and 
theaters to see musicals in New York and in Boston and here in Hamburg. And I could also see that they started with a different concept of sound. It's becoming more immersive. Also in the, in the free field business, meaning in the concert business, they have a lot more immersive sound. I wouldn't call it really immersive, but a lot more speakers also on the back and um, more delay lines. They really take care that the sound really grabs you. If they realize that a good sound really, really um, touches your emotion. Thank you. That's really clear. I, I Thank you very much. You've given me a wonderful uh, interview and uh, I'm delighted to spend a little time with you. I hope that yeah. our paths will cross. Now, tell me how you're doing these days anyway, just to... Well, actually, we've come very, very far in the... F- What's in the last year, I put the business in the hands of a friend of mine who's our integrator, Willie Fastenau. He's got a company called Park Boulevard. He's mm-hmm. also teaching at Juilliard. He's a musician. He built a studio at Juilliard, and then he wound up doing live sound, and also he builds uh, concert r- rooms and um, a variety of installations, and he was doing all of our sound installations. And so now that we're one company, it's fantastic, because Jeff and Willie and I and uh, a new fellow named Colin, all of us talk about each project we're doing and we figure out how to do everything and so now we have for example started to work with natural sound plus noise for natural Mm -hmm. sound masking and we build dynamic systems now we're putting one into a bank in Mm -hmm. order to create good workplace sound and create concentration we Mm -hmm. continue to get work in hospitals the assignments are all very diverse but we had to really improve the software a great deal so you'll get a software upgrade with this feature of natural sound masking, which I think you'll find fun, because you can also use it. For example, we have a a museum we're working on. The museum is about a massacre that occurred in the woods in Latvia. As you go room by room by room, it gets darker and darker until finally you as a visitor on the back of a truck where you were massacred. It's a very, very dark experience, but we take the mood using that mixture of natural sound and noise and it functions just like you know clean sound in a good movie i mean somebody like david lynch or hitchcock or any of the really great filmmakers are doing things with the sound in addition to the music in order to create the mood and so that enables you with the system now to easily control mood as well as do the various mixes you're doing so uh, it's it's come a long way also we've standardized kits for planetariums uh, you'll get a list of them the different size planetariums different size kits we're hoping to uh, close a deal now to be um, distributed by one of the large projection companies particularly now that they have led projectionless yeah. screens we're the only 360 sound system that's just the way it is <laughs> making the 360 sound uh, is, is now something very interesting because with our system you can suddenly make people feel like you're hanging in the middle of air uh, mm. by making the room acoustics uh, feel that way the floor disappears so these sonic illusions uh, are all part of what we're doing so it's been a you know slow evolution but working with a guy who does the installations we've come down to figure out what parts are good and how to install it clean and how to test the rooms we've become a more technical artisanal company in that way um so that that's been good you know i come from the creative side and it's good to have somebody as the chief who's every, make sure everything's perfect technically and uh, and so forth yeah wow that sounds great i mean you're, you're on a different end of the business than i am part of I mean, we know, overlap yeah i would love to give you a project where you could do the mixing i have to say that the dry Praga tracks, we use them everywhere we do a presentation as some of the best examples of immersive sound. Cool. People love, they don't care, they're listening to German, and the, just the spatiality and the way you handle the space uh, is just magical, and uh, so we are looking very hard to find situations where we can work together, so um, know that if, you know, if somebody has something that you think we could collaborate on, you know, let us know. I've been looking for, you know, really interesting stories that could be developed into planetarium shows because uh, I think that model that was begun by the guys who did Dry Fraga, I-, I think it's a viable model. And, and particularly there's so many planetariums in small towns where people want that kind of different entertainment. And and they're like also culturally relevant stuff. One of my associates is a filmmaker and she lives in the Yukon. She's uh, from a Native American band, you know, she's with the Tlingit tribe and uh, also first class filmmaker, won various, all sorts of prizes. And she's really interested that there should be a more immersive film experience available because she comes out of, you know, tribal ceremonies. And in a way, there's a 
connection. Well, that's, it's a you know, the planned term scene is it's difficult to get into. In Germany, at least, I don't know how it is in the US or in Asia, but you know, Germany, it's everything is linked to a public funding and public whatever. So it takes ages if their decisions are made and it's hard to get into it. So I see your point that it, t- it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to really break through that scene. Yeah, absolutely. Well, fortunately, I'm not just into that scene. I mean, my, uh, my museums was where we started and corporate mm-hmm. headquarters and uh, and now hospitals. Uh, these are, in a way, much easier markets. I mean, from a marketing point of view, if one sale to a hospital means many, many rooms. One sale to a planetarium means one room. Sure. So it's a, it's a no-brainer that you need to have a, a client that will have not just one place but other places and will give you some rolling business so you don't have to start from zero to get a job over and over again oh but that's what's going on i hope that you're having a nice summer yeah it's um, at the end of the year we start the next three um recording the, the voices for for the next three five Fragezeichen. oh great we should be starting um you know next fall fall 2020 so i'm quite excited about that and I'm looking into different concepts. Um, you know, the, the only problem if you go into a really big planetarium, I, I probably will do it differently this time because the distance is just so long for the sound. Right. And for one person, it's so loud. For the other person, it's not loud enough. So I, I'm working on different concepts. But we'll see. Well, that's good to know. I should probably get back to the, those guys because we've made it possible now to do cheaper portable systems. and uh, Yeah. They were interested in the possibility that they could do licenses to places where they would have temporary systems. And, uh, hey, well, well, thank you for the lovely chat. And uh, I'll be in touch when I, I'm sure as I get things together. And Okay. Well, good to talk to you, too. And be well. We will. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. Well, thank you. This is Immerse, the podcast and book. We are delighted to have you join us. Immerse is produced by Charlie Morrow. Sean McCann and Bart Plantinga for Morrow Sound, Vermont and Helsinki, and Recital Edition, Los Angeles. Immerse. Immerse. An empty shell fall back into the sea. Something different.